Welcome to Bella Vista Gardening Program today. I'm Barb Templin, usually Jerry Horner is sitting in the seat, but I get to move up to the first seat. And today with me is Tony Lacuzzi, who was, who is a member of the Garden Club and the former president of the Garden Club. But now we don't have to call him the big kahuna anymore, like he wanted to. <laughs> He's also a master gardener and a master naturalist, and today we'll be discussing some upcoming events for uh, the Garden Club and the Bella Vista Daffodil and uh, spring blooming plants and things you should be doing in your garden at this time of the year. Now, we wanted to start out with the Bella Vista Fall Plant Sale, and that's gonna be on October 7th from eight to one at Allen's Foods in their parking lot there. And we'll have hostas and trees and bulbs and I've been told surprised irises and what are lilies. What that means is we don't know what color they are. It's a surprise. So, uh, and I'm sure that you have a lot that you want to mention about the fall plant sale also. I do. Um, He's never for a loss of words. Well, you know, this will be the third year we've done a fall plant sale at Allen's. And uh, it, uh, the second year, and we were successful the first year, and then the second year was even better. And this year, it's planning to be even so much more Huge. so. Huge. And the reason is we've had a very uh, mild summer and a lot of rainfall. So that means that our perennial beds that we maintain of, of perennials that came out of Garden Club members from all over Bella Vista, uh, the plants have made it through the summer in really good condition. So we're going to have a lot of uh, really nice perennials for fall planting. That's number one. Number two, uh, we will have mums this year, okay? That's a new addition. Potted mums. We've never had this before. They're going to be two feet wide, two feet tall in decorative pots, okay, for $15. Oh my gosh, that's two a Two by steal. two in a decorative pot. The pot's worth 10, okay? So, but here's the deal. There will only be 100 of them, so first come, first serve. So get there early on the 7th. The other thing is uh, we will have uh, our famous Bella Vista Garden uh, gloves there, of course. But... Uh, more important than that, we'll have the Bella Vista Daffodil for sale again at below market prices. We buy such large quantities in the thousands that when you buy half a dozen online, you're going to be paying about 40% more, okay, than buying them from us, okay? And uh, uh, a, a brown bag full from us, a sandwich bag full of bulbs is $7. Now, the Bella Vista Daffodil Bulb, I don't know, are you showing it? There it is, it's on the screen now. That is the name of that cultivar. There's hundreds of different cultivars of daffodils. This one, the international name for this bulb is the Bella Vista Daffodil. And the, hey. and the flower itself is it's huge. It's unique, it's a big flower, it's a first cousin to an amaryllis. Um, and this, this bulb, uh, we started this program with the city, you know, two years ago. We've got them planted at City Hall at all the fire stations at the library and so forth. We've got some banks doing it. and But, you know, if you don't have, if you haven't planted at least six bulbs in front of your house, uh, now I don't consider you a citizen of Bella Vista, <laughs> okay? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had hundreds of thousands of Bella Vista daffodils blooming all at the same time? All People would come here from miles around to see the daffodil blooms in these hills every spring. It would be a tremendous draw. Uh, other communities have done it with other kinds of plants. We can do it with this thing. It is deer resistant. It is disease resistant. Okay. Uh, I have uh, a question. Is yeah. it something that you can broadcast? Is, uh, you know, no, I'm going to tell you how to plant it. Okay. Yeah. But it, no disease problems, no bug problems, no deer problems. If you know how to dig a hole and kick dirt in a hole, well, that's all you got to do. So in common areas, like if you live on a cul-de-sac and you got that 
little area out front there that nobody ever does anything with, stick a couple of dozen bulbs out there so you got, you know, when it's spring. Uh, put some around the bottom of your mailbox in a little circle that you've got out front. You know, there's a number of ways that you can get some daffodils out front. So, you know, in rough areas like I do on the edges of the golf course and places like that, I just dig a hole and kick the dirt over. In my personal landscape at home, you know, uh, I, I'll dig the hole and I'll put a little bit of bone meal in there, which helps blooming, and cover it up. So that's the planting part. They come back year after year after year after year. The only maintenance is some people have a tidy issue, okay? And the tidy issue would be when it's through blooming, if that spent bloom bothers you, just snip it off with scissors, okay? If the green parts, if the green foliage bothers you, okay, because I get calls on this all the time, that's why I'm mentioning it now. If the green part bothers you, okay, you need to leave that. It's got to be there for a minimum six weeks to recharge the bulb from the sun. So if it bothers you, just take the green parts, bring them down, tie them together with a piece of twine or stick some landscape pins on them or anything to hold it laying down on the ground and then just let it wither away into the soil. That's the best way to do it. But if you must, that sixth or seventh or eighth week, if there's a little brown still up there and you want to snip it off, you can, but not before six weeks. And they'll come back year after year. And about every five years or so, you can get in there with a spade and dig them up and harvest all the babies and you'll have four times as many as you had when you started. So, uh, When is the it's, best time It's like for putting us. money in the bank. You want to plant them in October, November, December. Sometime, so yeah, I'd it's get them cooler. In, I'd get them in before then. Christmas. I would say yeah. between Halloween and Christmas oh, okay. uh, is a great time. So it's got to be below 50, below yeah, 60? Yeah, you want cool, you want cool weather. They, they, don't like, uh, they don't like wet conditions, and they, don't li and they like good drainage. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a tall plant. It's a big bloom. So get them deep. Yes. Get them a good seven inches deep, uh, I would recommend everybody. But uh, we, and the, the fat part of the bulb goes in first. Yeah, but we have a great source for these bulbs uh, out of Holland, and they are, uh, you know, like fruits are graded. Only in Holland are like this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how fruits are graded, you know, uh, grade A fancy and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, bulbs are too. So if you go to a really cheap uh, uh, you know, a, a chain store, you're going to get the cheaper bulbs. These are the top grade bulbs that money can buy, and we'll have them and they're, for, they're for seven dollars a, a bag. So there you go. See you on October seventh. Yes, absolutely. Now, since we're talking about spring bulbs, is there any other kind of spring? Uh, plants that we can plant now or any bulbs or plants well first bulbs all right and then second plants trees it, talk to me about yeah well fall for bulbs uh, yeah I love bulbs. crocus love crocus because okay. that's the very first one that's going to bloom okay you and know. when they, they're same they time, in. same timing oh okay. same timing uh, crocus the then uh, the hyacinths okay okay and tulips, of course. Mm -hmm. love, love. The tulip, the, the crocus and the hyacinth, you're going to get year after year after year. The, the tulips, you know, you're, unless you dig them up and you put them in storage and do all that, uh, your tulips are going to be a one-season deal. But, God, they're worth it. Yes. You know, I mean, come on. They're, yes. They're beautiful. So uh, Now, uh, are all of those that you mentioned deer-resistant and that sort of thing, too? Yeah, or? they've never bothered mine. Okay. So, as far as I know, they are. Okay. You know, and they've had... You know, I haven't shooed the deer away, and they haven't touched them, so. Oh. I, I don't know on that, but I've never heard anybody complain about it. They love hostas, though. <laughs> yes, hostas is like candy to, uh, yes. to deer. Yes, So, it is. you know, it, it's unfortunate, but because um, I have hostas now that are this tall. Yeah, it's the caviar the, of the plant world for that's deer, right. right? That's right. <laughs> so now if we were going to be talking about um, planting in general, uh, huh. Things you want to add. To well, you can still your... add some perennials. You know. Okay, so what know. type of perennials would you be adding in the fall? You can anything that's been divided that you've uh, needed to be divided, and then you want to put in, or you've a plant you've always wanted, and we'll have a bunch of those at the plant sale. We'll have a lot of perennials, and they'll do okay. great. 
But more importantly, uh, and uh, I don't know more people need to do it, uh, the best time for trees and shrubs is the fall. Really? Why is it? Well, for one thing, they're big plants and they have big root systems. And when people run to nurseries in March, April, May, June, okay, and they buy big plants, what's next? July and August. What right. comes with July and August? Typically, no rain and a lot, a lot of, of heat. heat. Big stress on the root system. Well, guess what? When you plant the big shrubs and the big tree, shrubs and trees in September, October. Oh, so you're planting it, those before you the think it's a dormant plant, right. but underneath the ground, all October, November, December, January, February, March, the root system is growing. So whose root system do you think is going to handle July and August better? The guy that planted in the fall, fall. or the guy that planted yeah. in the spring? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. it's not rocket science. Yeah. So, real important. The other thing I want to mention on trees and shrubs is, is plant them shallow. Most people plant too deep. What happens if you plant Common too deep? Common mistake. When you plant too deep, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have girdling of the roots, a lot of other issues, especially on trees, that will manifest themselves 5, 10, and sometimes 20 years down the road. And the, then the calm, then an, a, a really good arborist comes along and says, well, I can tell you, Mrs. Jones, what's wrong with this tree? It was planted too deep initially. Okay? Oh. Plant them shallow. If you look in nature at trees that grow just all by themselves without any help from anybody, they all have a trumpet, a root flare. They got roots laying on top of the ground. They're shallow. If you go to Tower Grove Park in St. Louis, which is almost the size of Central Park in New York mm -hmm. and is owned by the, the, the Shaw family, of, you know, mm -hmm. they have more botanists there than the ewes in London. Wow. And they have air spaded every single tree in that park. In other words, they, with air, they've blown away all the dirt off all the roots and the flare and everything. The trees are gorgeous. Gorgeous, 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 beautiful, healthy trees. So what do you consider too deep? So plant minimum two inches above grade. So anyway, that's one thing. Plant your trees and so Only dig your hole that deep. Don't dig it too deep and then fill it in with soil and expect it to sit there because it's going to settle. Only go to the that depth. Okay. You're better too shallow than too deep. Too deep. That's number one. Number two thing that I want to mention, I don't want to get into whole, too many details today, but these are two critical things. The second most critical thing is you don't jump around on the dirt. You don't stamp it down. You don't add soil amendments in there. You don't throw in all kinds of other material. You oh. backfill with the original soil. Those roots, that's what they're going to have to spend their whole life in. Those roots are going to go out a long distance and they're going to find so don't make them hang around just in one little area because you put candy in the hole okay and that's what happens when you put in that, your yeah. so, enriched and soil you so you settle the dirt with water okay chocolate soup drown it absolutely drown it let water get rid of all the air pockets and everything and and let it dry and settle naturally and the other thing is you don't do berms oh you, yes. you know that is from that's technology from the 40s we've learned a lot <laughs> okay. so i planted it in september how often do i water it in the fall now because, when it's dry okay and how do i tell if it's dry stick my finger in there very good <laughs> i don't use my finger because it hurts <laughs> So I use a very long Phillips head screwdriver and I stick it in the ground, much easier to poke in the ground. Mm -hmm. And I give it a twist and I pull it out. If that Phillips head, the little tines on the end is empty, it's time to water. Oh, that is a very good idea. Because I now I've got it six inches down or five inches. That's a very if, good if idea. I, if I can get dirt out of it and roll it up in a little ball, mm -hmm. I don't need to water. Okay. So it, it really, you can't go by it's the really surface. Very high tech. Very. I can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to have a Phillips Everybody screwdriver. Everybody has a Phillips head <laughs> screwdriver. So, I you mean. You know, it's really simple. I, I do my lawn that way. When do I know when it's time to water the lawns? I go around and poke it around in a few places. You know, it's coming out dry. Do you have to explain that to your neighbors? Yes. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, 
but you want the, when you plant the tree, so mm -hmm. plant shallow or large shrubs, s settle it with water. Okay. You want everything to drain away from the plant. Not then, to pool. In now you want to add amendments. The amendments go up on top, compost and oh, mulch on okay. top, but not on the bark. So you're a couple of inches away from the... Exactly. Okay. Not on the bark. Okay. So now if, you got it. If we accidentally get carried away because we're so enthusiastic right. about enriching the soil on top and we have it up against the bark, yeah. does that mean that it'll, it's more open to disease? Correct. Oh, okay. And other things. And uh, Yes, yeah. and other things. Yeah. So what, what kind of disease uh, would we be looking at? Anything this fall that could be fall? No. Or, okay. There's too many. <laughs> too many to <laughs> too list. Too many to list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The disease uh -huh. world, there's a lot of, there's probably thousands of pathogens. You never know which one's going to crop their head. But just, you don't want to provide habitat for Right. It. You right. know, it makes people like David Rains and myself and and uh, and David, I mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 Gerald Klingerman from uh, Fayetteville. from Fayetteville, the Botanical Gardens there. You know, we just we really uh, we drive by these big shopping centers where they've got mulch piled two feet up on I the know. bark of a tree, and they and you know, and I guess the developer thinks that looks real cute, and they've got some people that are supposedly landscapers that, you know, I don't know where they got their edu their horticultural backgrounds from. Uh, I doubt if they do, but we just cringe when we see that because we know they're going to And if you notice, they replace, they're constantly replacing trees, but they have budgets for it. So I guess it's easier. They just think that looks cute and they want to replace that stuff all the time. But, Is there anything but for the average homeowner, the average homeowner doesn't want to be involved in, uh, you know, in, uh, in replacing large trees and shrubs right. all the time. Right. Now, <laughs> is there anything that we should be doing as far as um, maintenance on these newly planted trees and shrubs? Is there's no trimming? Just don't, let them, get, just don't let them get dry. Just don't let them yeah, get dry. Yeah, I don't like cutting on trees. They've gone through so much shock just being transplanted and coming out of burlap or a container or whatever mm -hmm. and planted. Mm -hmm. I usually don't like to take a cutting tool to a tree, especially until after the first year, and oh, okay. then very judiciously, because you know they're a living organism just right. like us, right. and you know you get a paper cut, it hurts. Right. Well, you know, so any cut on any plant is a hurt to a living thing. Okay, and uh, so should that be? taken care of after you've cut it? Do you put anything nothing. on that? Nothing. Now with a tree, you want to leave a collar. You okay. Know, uh, every limb has a collar, mm -hmm. you know, so you want to determine where the collar and cut at the collar, not beyond it. You don't make flush cuts. And uh, no, the pruning paint thing is another throwback to the 50s. So. We don't, well, I we know don't, that one of we your... Don't, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> I know one of your <laughs> biggest complaints of a lot of people that that trim their crepe myrtles oh, yeah. in the fall. That's a large shrub. Yeah. Yes. Wrong, and they're wrong everywhere time. around here. Wrong time to trim yeah. crepe myrtles. <laughs> but they typically chop them down. I mean, yeah. so call, it's it's in I'm from Texas. We call it crepe myrtle murder. Oh, I w yes. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I I would think yeah, so. Um, Anybody watching this that <laughs> wants a, uh, a lesson in how to trim a crepe myrtle, contact me and uh, I'll send you the instructions. Okay. Now, yeah. we've been growing our, our gardens and our, our perennials and annuals all summer long. Now it's coming to fall and I know that there's a lot of things we should be doing out in the fall. Is there any... Um, the number one thing we should be doing to these plants that we've been, you know, taking care of all summer you're long. You're talking about your perennial flower beds? Your perennial flower and beds. shrubs and trees. And yeah. Yeah, just a, a good all-purpose uh, fertilizer. I like natural fertilizers, you know, uh, you know, uh, rather than synthetic ones. And, uh, and uh, 
and do a good job of mulching with natural materials like shredded leaves, shredded hardwoods, shredded cedar, you know, uh, things of that nature. And, uh, avoid, uh, you know, shredded building materials that have been yes. uh, dyed purple or orange or pink or whatever. Right. You know, right. Um, most most microorganisms in life in the soil they're they're not big on eating writ dye so <laughs> that's that's <laughs> not, that's not a, that's not that, a diet they? that they're they're really happy with so you know well, we don't need to be dyeing our mulches <laughs> right and and dyeing bills you know scraps from building sites that have been shredded <laughs> right okay we need we got you know we got plenty of leaves to be shredded we got plenty of of brush and timber and limbs and things that make the best mulch and it breaks down and it enriches the That's soil. That's the purpose of a mulch yeah. though, isn't it? Is to break down and, yeah. and enrich and, the and, soil, and, correct? And, and increase the, you know, let it turn to humus and provide food for all this, the life in the soil. And you'll be surprised when you're planting next spring how many earthworms you're going to find. You so know. we're going to keep deadheading our, our flowers. Sure. And Until it's all over. Right. And and when it's all over, we know that uh, it's. And when uh, they when they turn brown, cut them down. Yes. You know, your perennials. I'm talking about. Right. You know, and mulch. Right. Now, are there any? And wait for spring. Are there any annuals that we can plant this fall uh, that like um, the cooler weather? Uh, I can't think of any offhand. It's like still time pansies to get, or yeah. Well, I plant pansies every year. So. Oh, do you? And you can still get zinnias in the ground. You got some bald spots. You can still yeah. throw out some zinnia seed and still get some zinnias to do for you in September and maybe early October. Mums, of course, you can get the mums going. Uh, but yeah, pansies. Uh, you know, I have one bed I do in pansies every year. Uh, but the last couple of years, I've switched to a different. It's a it's a cross between a pansy and a viola. Oh. It's called a palom paloma. Paloma. And uh, what I found with the palomas are more and more nurseries are starting to carry them, and more of the mass planters at shopping centers and mm -hmm. things are starting to get into them. What I found with them is they <clears throat> they recover from snow and ice faster than the conventional pansy. Oh, do I, they do that, they look the they, same? They look. You most ninety nine of people I have a hundred wouldn't know the difference. Okay. But they, uh, they recover quicker after being covered in snow and ice. That's one thing. And they grow more in a more of a mound shape, like this pumpkin. Okay? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So rather than in more like the flat spreading thing, like the typical pansy. Sure, sure. So uh, look into those. Uh, you can get them assorted or you can get them in individual colors. And uh, it's, a, it's a great plant. I've, I've done them two years now and I've had great success with yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For vegetable gardens, they're they're winding down. Yep. What are some of the things that we should be doing in our vegetable gardens this clean time them. of the year? Clean them, number one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get out and, there with the yeah, soap and water. Yeah. <laughs> number two, still time, you know, you can be planting things like uh, spinach and kale and uh, Brussels sprouts. And, and it has uh, time you know, to grow and yeah, you harvest yeah. There's it. There's a, a number of things that you can Those still, are cool. Yeah, that uh, you can still plant now. But uh, when it uh, is, when that growing season is, you know, uh, completely and over with, uh, you know, just, you know, get a good uh, natural fertilizer down, get everything mulched really good. And um, you don't take the old vegetable plants and mulch them into the ground for like well, tomatoes. definitely not tomatoes. Uh, tomato, why is that? tomato plant. They tomato plants have a habit of of, of, of attracting a lot of diseases, oh. and you don't know if you have the disease or you don't. So it's a, the best, and they they harbor they they hang out in the soil a lot. Oh. So it's best when you pull up tomato, go up, pull them up by the roots and everything, put them in a plastic bag, and, you know, get them off your property rather than going to the compost bin. Pretty much all the other plants, you know, that I'll like the uh, uh, my Swiss chard I've, I've still got left over at my place and some right. things like that. Uh, that stuff I'll throw in the compost bin. Oh, you okay. Know, they don't have the disease problems and things like that. Well, but, you have a lawn, yes. and so what kind of things do you do for your lawn in the the fall? In the fall? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the you cut it really, really short. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. No, no. Every neighbor I have that has grass cuts their grass well, to about three quarters of an well, inch. Well, can and, I tell you something? If yes. At every university in the United States, the turf specialist at that university would give them a failing grade. Yes. <laughs> okay. At every university in America that has a turf specialist in their ag department. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half inches is minimum, minimum, minimum. Okay. Okay. I'm at three right now, and I've kept it three. But the year that we had triple digits for eight weeks, okay? Yes. And uh, we had no rain. So hot. And it, we yes. had no rain. I went to four. I was the only green lawn in the neighborhood. So there you are, folks. So are okay. you fertilizing then? Are you? I would... Um, well, first of all, September is a good time if you're using cool season grasses to overseed again, to reseed. Oh, okay. You know, the fescues and the mm -hmm. rise and the Kentucky blue and all that stuff. Uh, uh, whether you're using one seed or three seed or five seed mix is a good time. Uh, it's September. We have a visitor. Yes. Is this Who a loves pet? Tony. Is, is, this a, is this a pet you brought from home? Yes. Is that Herman? Yes. <laughs> so, anyway, I thought I recognized him. Anyway. Uh, uh, so you, you want to get seed down, uh, but let me tell you a, a little secret. Okay. I'm in the secret. Right before the first heavy frost or freeze is an outstanding time to cover your lawn in a quarter to a half an inch of compost, mushroom compost, or just regular compost or anything like that nature. Really? Okay. And that doesn't you, smother. You, no, you will have a yeah, quarter, half an inch. You will have a black lawn for two days. And then you'll never know that you ever put it down because the, with the weather and the wind and everything, it'll just all decompose and it'll, you won't even know it. But next spring, I promise you, you'll be the greenest, the first and the greenest lawn on your whole block. Okay. <laughs> in okay. the spring. You'll green up faster than anybody. Now, we have very, very poor topsoil here in Bella Vista. And so the, the secret to lawns is, you know, you know, in gardening, you got two camps. You got the chemical world and you got the natural world. And wherever you are, that's okay. You know, it's up to you. But when it comes to lawns, Nothing responds to a natural program more than a lawn, and nothing hurts a lawn more than chemical fertilizers. Fact, fact, fact. I'll prove it to you a hundred different ways. Okay? Natural fertilizers. Leave the grass clippings down. When you get a mulching mower, grind the leaves up on the lawn. Put down compost. Right. Right. Okay, you're going to see year after year that lawn getting better and better and better. Year after year after year after year, it just keeps getting better. I clean out flower beds, I trim shrubbery, I do, I throw it all out, and then I mow with my mulch. <laughs> We've got okay. a little bit of time, yeah. just a little bit, but I want you to touch on roses and invasive plants. Okay, just, what do you want to know about roses? What do we do for roses right now? Well, keep them deadheaded. Okay. You know, we've had a lot of rain. Keep your eye open for black spot. Oh, okay. that's, yes. So three things on black spot really, really quick. Okay. What I do is every Sunday morning after breakfast, I go out and I got a little can of stone ground cornmeal and I sprinkle about four little things of cornmeal on each plant. Oh. Okay. Because cornmeal is a natural fungicide and it just falls to the ground and it dissolves with your rain and water and everything into the ground. And that's a good preventative and you have very few got a really rainy area, you've been on vacation, you came back and black spot has started already and you get starting to get a little handle on you, you can get a cup of cornmeal and a paint cloth or something like that, mm -hmm. a nylon stocking and a bucket, a two gallon bucket of water, leave it overnight, squeeze it really good and make, you know, a cornmeal juice, pour it on the plants as a drench. If you've got a plant that has been defoliated practically and, okay, step number three, and you go, oh my God, I'm going to lose this rose, it's going to die. You know, to the cornmeal drench, add uh, a cup of milk to that two-gallon bucket of water and cornmeal drench. Okay. And pour that on there. 
that'll take care of and clean up all the leaves underneath the right. plant, get them all out of there. Uh, so that's that part. Uh, if you if you have uh, flora uh, plants that are you know that bloom all the time, not that not just once or twice a year. Uh, if the rule of thumb is if it's blooming, feed it once a month. If it's not blooming, stop feeding because blooms use a lot of energy, energy to produce all those blooms. They got to have food. So if you see blooms, you can feed once a month. Pick a day of the month, what, what, pick a day, the 15th of every month, the first of every month, whatever works for you. And no, that's when you go out and you throw a fistful of fertilizer on your roses. So Okay, one sentence on invasives. Uh, I, you know, uh, of course, you, you know, you want to tackle them. I like tackling them in the dead of winter. You know, because But how do you identify them in the dead of winter? Oh, I know where they are. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, you know I, I know poison ivy vines when I right, see them. Right, And I know a privet brush when I see, you know. Uh, but that honeysuckle not, there's, vine yeah, and grapevine. There, there's not, yeah, same thing. Not a lot to do in January and February. So and, uh, work you know, on. Yeah, I think it's a great time to go in, uh, and tackle those e evasives. Uh, I, I just find uh, it's a lot safer for me <laughs> then going out this time of year when there's foliage on the evasives and spraying them with carcinogens. <clears throat> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to get that in. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Tony, for all your wonderful information. And we can uh, invite everybody to uh, the, the Bella fall Vista. plant sale. Yes, the fall plant sale. On October but before 7th that, in front of Allen's. That's right. Our uh, Bella Vista Garden Club will meet September 28th at 11 o'clock, and we have a new place that we're meeting this year. Community Church. The Bella Vista Community Church, uh, kind of by the library, just down right. the street uh, a little bit. And at that time, we'll be awarding the Dorothy Wallace Scholarships. So it's a, it's a wonderful meeting to come uh, to, and everybody is welcome to come and have lunch and these are the kids at U of A that are in their junior or senior year that are excelling, that have some budgetary problems and that we got to get them through school, you know, and we give thousands of dollars from the Garden Club to this thing and the recipients will uh, be there and will be awarded at that first meeting. And the fall plant these sale are, is a fundraiser for these. Just so you know, Scott Eccleson at Crystal Bridges is one of those, okay? Corrine Troutman from the Peel Compton Foundation is another one, okay? This money goes to a really good cause. Well, I hope that everybody learned a little something today, and I'd like to thank Tony again for coming. Thanks for having me. Jerry, wherever you are, we miss you, and hope that you'll be back next month. And until we meet again, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>